Yep. Yep. Okay. So I square C stands for inter IC. This is one of the most important serial protocols that you will encounter in your uh, work, uh, you know, projects in the future. Uh, and also we're gonna use I square C protocol in our second lab. So I square C is originally designed by Philips to enable inter IC communication using a minimal number of pins. And in particular, we use two pins for communicating um, using I square C protocols besides you know, power and ground. Using I square C, we can build a very simple universal bus for different ICs from different vendors. The hardware specification of this protocol is very simple. Uh, even if you implement in software, it's still possible. The operation speed of the bus is at 100 kilobits per second or 400 kilobits per second for most of the ICs. For newer ones, they can support 3.4 megabits per second. Now, this is not very high speed, but for most of the um, ICs that you will work with uh, in embedded system domain, uh, these uh, data rates are sufficient. Yes, uh, I square C protocol has a few uh, great features. There are no special wiring or connectors needed. You have two lines, one is called serial data, denoted as SDA. The other line is serial clock, denoted as SCL. And each device on this I square C bus has its own unique address and it's software addressable. So you can use your program to select different devices that you can talk to or you want to talk to. It supports master slave relationship and possibly have multiple masters. It, has, uh, it does zero transfer as we mentioned earlier, uh, every um, transfer takes, you know, transfer one bit. And overall you can transfer eight bit during one transaction. You can do bi-directional data transfer. So let's say you have a master and you have a slave, you can write from the master to the slave or read from the slave device to the master device using the same two wires. And the max bus capacity, uh, uh, yes, uh, 400 picofarad. Um, there are several serial bus um, standards or protocols. UART was the one we talked about earlier. And SBI and I square C are also popular protocols, especially in modern embedded system design. Uh, there are CAN devices, uh, control area network, um, and also USB. USB is you know, very popular, of course, uh, not only in embedded domain, but also in very um, um, general purpose situations. This table just qualitatively compare these protocols. Um, and these are um, some uh, rough comparisons and they are not very you know, um, quantitative. Uh, but you can get a sense which protocols uh, are um, popular and, and why. Um, so the software that involved in I square C protocol is um, basically using uh, simple messages uh, generated from microcontrollers to convey information on address and data. And devices often have complete interfaces, which means that you, when you work with I square C devices, if that device supports I square C protocol, it will be able to generate 
these signals from the hardware itself. We will see the timing diagrams uh, later, uh, or illustrations of the uh, uh, two, two wires, how they transfer data and, about, and address values. But most of the time, you don't have to write software to generate individual clock signal. Rather, you will use the control registers or other registers of the I2C device to, um, to send in, uh, necessary information out or receive data back. The general procedure for communication. So we'll, uh, we have you know, generally uh, a master device and several slave devices. You can have the master to talk to any one of these slave devices one by one, not at the same time. The reason being that this is still a bus. So you cannot have more than one people talk at the same time. Uh, otherwise there will be a lot of uh, interference and you won't be able to tell which signal is the valid signal. So the first step is to wait until I square C bus is free. Now the indication of uh, the bus is free is when both SDA and SCL are high. And we'll uh, see some illustrations later. And after that, if one side, especially master, is trying to communicate, it will put a start message on the bus to claim the bus. And that's the one step that the master will claim the bus and be able to have other ICs ready to listen. It will then put a clock signal on the SCL line for others as reference time. And because it's a bus, so this SCL line can be seen by all the other ICs which are now listening. And the data on the SDA wire must be valid when SCL switching from low to high. And we'll see some illustrations and I'll explain further. There are two steps. Well, one important step is first, we need to put um, binary address in series to identify target IC. You can connect multiple ICs on the same I2C bus, and which is often the case. But each of these ICs has its own unique address. It could be a seven bit address or in a, in a later uh, specification, you can have a 10 bit address. But most of the time you have a seven bit address to identify the device. Then you need to put some indication to identify the direction of the transfer. And this is talking from the master side. Is it sending or is it receiving? And then after that, uh, the um, master will require other ICs to acknowledge the address and the readiness to transfer. And after that, the actual transfer happens. Uh, this can be 8-bit data uh, after receiving ACK. And when we see 8-bit data, uh, this data can be uh, interpreted by the, the slave as addresses, if that's the case. Uh, if the slave IC is trying to um, look into some of its own internal registers, then it has to use some address. And this transfer could happen, you know, multiple um, transactions. And at the very end, the master will send a stop message to free up the bus. So these descriptions could be uh, very confusing, but uh, we'll see some illustration very soon. Uh, hopefully you understand this better. Now we said earlier that the master needs to send out address. The way to identify a I2C device is to use an address. The address generally is seven bit address and every device that you connect onto the same I2C bus has to have different address from other ones. Otherwise you'll be um, confusing yourself. Uh, this means that if you connect the same type of IC on the same bus, you need to have a way to differentiate these two, especially they are from the same vendor. Now the question could be, um, how do we know the address? 
if I just purchase I square C device. When you purchase I square C device, like the accelerometer that we're going to work with, uh, MPU6050, by design, the vendor has assigned a unique address in this chip. So you don't get to choose the address. It's the address, it's the device itself has a built-in address. So you have to make sure that you are not you know, um, using the same address on the same bus for different devices. Um, devices with master capability can identify themselves. Um, this is, um, for some cases, you can do that. Um, the, again, only one pair of devices can have a data transfer session at a time because this is still a bus. You cannot have more than um, two person talking at the same time. This is the hardware architecture, essentially a simple schematic how we possibly connect I square C devices. We don't show the power and the ground, uh, but besides those, we have this SCL and data line, SCL and SDA. We only need these two lines. We often have multiple I square C devices. So you can have this one, this one, and other ones. All these I square C devices connect to these two wires. So each of them has a separate SDA and separate SCL um, pin that will be connected to this bus. On this bus, there's also uh, pull-up resistors, typically 2K or 10K ohm. And there's uh, VDD to supply the, the power to the system. And for each of the I square C device, uh, they use those open collector design so that it can e effectively isolate itself from the bus if necessary. And uh, we look at into this open collector design when we talk about the IO pins. So this is essentially the same. On the input side, uh, we uh, can use this other um, circuitry to receive information from the bus. This is another example where we have this I square C bus and we have a few things on the device, on the bus. We have a microcontroller, which is function as a master. We have three I square C devices function as slave. We have double EEPROM, this is a read-only memory. We have a temperature sensor, and we have a LCD controller. So all these four components are connected to the bus, and only the master will be able to initiate the transfer. There are certain signal patterns that are important for having this i squared protocol to work. We mentioned earlier that the very basic status for the bus is to be in the idle state. When in the idle state, the both of these two wires are gonna be uh, logically high. So you see here, here, this means this is a, before this point is a high, um, the bus is in the idle state. And then at some point, the master will pull this SDA line to low, okay, as we see here, this is an indication that um, the master is going to start doing the communication. So this is what we call the start condition. So again, the start condition is, begins when the, um, both of the wires have a uh, status as high. So that means the bus is idle and the master drives this SDA line to low, indicating it's gonna start uh, doing the transfer. And after that, the um, master will start generating the clock signals. You can imagine that each of these square box is half of the cycle, so we can have a clock signal going like this pattern um, until, the, uh, until it stops. And speaking of the stop, so this uh, is the counterpart of the start condition. This is the stop condition. So the clock signal will be maintaining high and which means the clock pulses have been stopped. And then this SDA is um, pulled up. So the 
uh, voltage level from zero becomes one. Uh, and then this is an indication that the master device stopped the transfer. So the communication uh, protocol just uh, finishes here. So what's more interesting is ha what happens between the start and the stop. Between the start and stop, what we really, do, really need to do uh, is to sending zeros or ones uh, between these two devices. So what we have here is a, a pattern for sending signal or a value zero. This is the clock coming from the master. Okay, so you can see this is kind of one half of the clock cycles. In the lower half, or when the clock signal is low, this is the moment the sender can change the value on SDA. When the clock is high, this is the moment that the, the value on the SDA should maintain solid or valid. So if the sender wants to change the value that will be sent out, it has to change during this half of the cycle. So that when the clock signal is low, where when the clock signal is high, uh, this half of the cycle, this is when the sender has to maintain the value. And in this case, uh, it maintains zero. So that's when we send out a zero. And the other case, as we shown here, in the, when the clock signal is low, the sender um, changes the value and uh, changes the one. So when the clock um, is high, this is the value gonna be sent out. So this will be the case we send out a one. Okay, now we have the basic components of the uh, transfer. We know the start, we know the stop, and we know how to send a zero and ones. Now, when the actual communication happens, uh, the sender and receiver will work uh, in tandem and following this kind of pattern. So as we show in this example here, in, we have a start condition, okay, because the, uh, we start with the idle and then the SDA pull to low, so the clock starts. And then the first cycle uh, that we gonna be sending out is uh, a bit A6, and then A5, and another cycle A4, all the way to A0. And you notice that uh, this is again, uh, the timing diagram. So you see this double um, you know, lines in parallel, just indicating the data is valid. And then here uh, we use this A6, A5, A6, zero, we have seven bits here. These seven bits are the address, uh, represent the address of the target IC that the sender is trying to communicate to. So whoever here has th that address will, will should respond. So if we have, uh, let's say zero, zero, all the way zero, except this, uh, this bit is a one. So if we have these seven bits, zero, 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 all the way until the last, until the very uh, least significant bit, this is a one. So can you tell me which one of these ICs should respond? The e -prom? That's right. So the double E prompt should respond because that's its address, one. So if this double E prompt is connected properly and it's function, uh, functioning as normal, it should respond. But before it responds, there's one more bit we need to send out from the sender. That's this read and write. Because based on this value here, we will, um, we will know, well, the, the servant will know what kind of operation this master is trying to do. So up to this point, we have 
the seven bit address, we have read write indication. Then the next thing should happen is uh, for the servant to acknowledge that. And this is the acknowledge bit. So the servant should put a zero here to acknowledge that. And then what follows will be the next uh, eight bit. Now the next eight bit uh, could be um, data. So like we show here, we have um, D8, uh, actually this should be D7, um, D6 up to D0. So eight bits coming out from the next um, sequence of clock pulses. And once these eight bits are received by the sender, or um, sorry, by received by the um, receiver, the receiver should acknowledge. So which means it's gonna be uh, pulling uh, the data bit to zero to acknowledge that. Um, this is another case why we use um, high logic high on both wires to indicate that's a, a idle status, uh, simply because we use this zero to indicating the acknowledgement. And after that, we'll stop the pulse and uh, we will um, return this um, SDA line to high. So we end up uh, having a stop condition. And so this uh, whole transaction finishes. I have to mention that uh, in many situations, this kind of transfer could go on for multiple transactions. So not only first byte, could be second byte, could be third byte and so on. Depends on the actual chip you talk to. But every um, transaction you, ex you can expect that there will be eight bits with, uh, followed by an acknowledgement, another eight bits followed by an acknowledgement. Okay, this is a, another example. Uh, we have, um, let's see, there's a message in chat window. Okay, good question. What is the difference between servant and a receiver? Um, let me go back to the previous slide. Oh, what did I do? Okay. So we list here master and servant and multiple servants, in fact. The intention here is to say on this bus, there's only one of them or should be one of them um, control the whole thing. So that's what we call the master. And so the master will generate such clock signals to drive the data transfer and servant will respond uh, by acknowledging um, the address uh, by maybe sending the data. But is servant always a receiver or is servant always a sender? The answer is no, because when we say sender and receiver, what talking from the data transfer perspective, where the data goes from where to where. So we, we say that the data goes from the sender to the receiver. So if we're reading, let's say the microcontroller reads from double EEPROM, so who is the sender in this case? The EEPROM? That's right. So the WE prom is the sender because we read data from this device to the microcontroller. Now, in another case, if we want to control the LCD controller, uh, so we're gonna be writing some control information from the microcontroller to the uh, LCD controller. In that case, what is the role of this LCD controller in terms of sending or sender and receiver? LCD is the receiver? 
That's right. So LCD is the receiver. So sender and receiver are really talking about from data transfer direction perspective, whereas master and servant is to say who's driving the clock. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. You know, when we look at these I squared C devices, some of them can only be read. For example, this W prom, you expect only reading data from this you know, device. Uh, also for the temperature sensor, um, you, you, you read data from it, but there could be other I square C devices. You, you also, you do both read and write. So let me move on to the next slide. Uh, this is a, another example. Um, so we have quite a few I square C devices on this bus. Well, pull up re resistors. We have microcontroller, which uh, is the master. We have IO, we have ADDA, we have LCD, RTC, another microcontroller. And we have this WEPROM. Now this WEPROM, as you can see that we have uh, these L uh, SCL and SDA connected to it. So these are the two uh, wires required for I square C bus. In addition, we have a few extra pins that are specific to this WE prom. We have A2, we have A1, and A0. It's interesting that you see, you know, for this WE prom, we have extra pins. And if you read the data sheet of the uh, accelerometer that we're going to use, MPU 6050, you, you will find there's one pin, one extra pin instead. Now the reason being for this W devices, W prompt devices, uh, they could be from the same vendor. I'd say the vendor assigned the first four bit uh, for forming these seven bit address. And the vendor purposely leave these three bits open or configurable. And these three bits in the address is determined by how you connect these three physical pins coming from the chip. So in this case, the way we connect to it, this is the VCC. Uh, can you tell me what is the seven bit address of the subway prom chip? Zero one one. Oh no, one one zero. Okay, so well, I guess you're right. Depending on how you read it, so uh, so you have a two because it's grounded. So this value should be a zero, and this is one. This is one. So in fact, this is the exact address that will be assigned to this chip. Now, why do we do this? Why just, can't we just assign the seven bit and that's it? That wastes space. Uh, that could be a reason. But think about when you have a multiple WPROM chip from the same vendor, can you connect two of them on the same I2C bus? No. You cannot because if you connect exact the same chip with all these seven um, bit address fixed, then you're going to cause conflict. So the two of these W prom chip will not be able to respond correctly. So the reason behind this hardware selectable uh, address is to be able to have multiple such chips put onto the same I square C bus. Not every um, I square C devices do that, but some of them do, especially these W prom chips, uh, so that you can expand the uh, capacity of these chips.
Uh, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, this is just you know some different uh, addressing mode for seven bit versus ten bit. Um, it's a bit more complicated. As we mentioned earlier, the bus communication on the I square C uh, is using eighty bit byte. Each byte of transfer is acknowledged with the ninth data bit generated by the receiver. And apart from the start and stop, no device is allowed to change the state of the SDA bus. Uh, there's one line missing here. While the uh, clock signal is high, because the clock signal uh, is high, that that's where we uh, expect to have a valid data bit on the SDA line. Uh, multiple uh, masters can complete compete, but only one could win the bus, so it becomes the final master. And there's no minimal clock speed. It really depends on how quickly or how slowly the master generates the uh, the IC uh, the the clock signal. Also, the slower ICs can hold the SCL low. Um, so if you hold the SCL low, that means you have to wait until uh, the SCL, the clock line, become high to be able to read data. Uh, so this is a way to slow down the bus. That's called the clock stretching. Um, so here's some example of doing single read, or single write. Oh, there's one message from the chat. Is microcontroller always the master and device is always the servant? Uh, I would say so. Um, master is, uh, is always on the one who is capable of uh, initiating the, the data transfer. So yeah, microcontroller is always the master. Okay, so this is to write to the slave device. Uh, we will start the transaction with the start condition or start bit. Uh, and then we send out the slave address and, and we send out a zero. W bar, this is to say that write operation is uh, active low. Uh, so when you have a zero, that means that's a write operation. So whoever has this address, okay, should acknowledge saying that, okay, uh, I'm ready. So send me something because, you know, from the master, uh, it's gonna send the, um, um, the, some data. And then follows the data, the actual data coming from the sender to the receiver. And once that's done, so the device will acknowledge, uh, maybe another piece of data acknowledge. And, and, and P is the pause and that, you know, we can uh, just temporarily, um, stretch the clock. Um, and then for read, you can do uh, read from a slave device like this. Uh, you will send out the slave address and then you follow that uh, by using a one, uh, one indicating it's a read operation. Um, and then the uh, acknowledge will be from the uh, slave device. And the slave device will start you know, putting the data out on the bus because remember the master is trying to read. So the slave device will be putting data on it on a uh, one, one bit after bit. And the master device will acknowledge after reading the byte, another, um, uh, another byte and then acknowledge again. Um, the last one could be uh, just right before the, uh, actually, sorry, the P is stop here. Um, it's not clock square stretching. Okay. And master is the uh, master transmitter than the master receiver. Um, and it transmits clocks all the time. It sends the address, a sleep address, and then becomes the receiver for the case of this read. Uh, here are some more complicated case. Uh, we have uh, you know, 
you combine read and write, um, you, know, and you can you can read this. Well, let me explain a little bit. So let's see the combine write and read. So you start uh, the start condition. Again, you send the slave address. This is important for every um, transaction. And you, you send out zero after the address to indicate that, hey, slave, you know, number you know, 20, I want to write to you. So the slave will respond by sending an acknowledgement bit. And then the master will send out the actual data. Slave acknowledge. Master will send another byte. Slave acknowledge. And this is another start. Um, let me see. Yeah, there's another start um, condition. And then send out slave address. And this again, after that, we're going to do a read operation. So this one should be a one here to indicate that's a read operation. And the slave will acknowledge. And the uh, because it's a, it's a read, so the slave should send out the data. Master acknowledge. And then um, slave send out another data, another byte, and master acknowledge, and then stop. Yeah, this is some um, situations where the um, you can do clock stretching, and also you can uh, you should uh, acknowledge uh, you know the the receiver whoever receives the data should acknowledge, uh, and this is mandatory for doing that. If there's no acknowledge, the transfer will uh, be aborted. Clock stretching means the slave device can hold the clock line low, uh, and then the master, because it's on the same um, wire, so the master knows the clock line is being held low by the slave, so it will slow down the clock. Voltage level translation is uh, important where you have i squares devices operating at different voltage levels. Traditionally, i squares devices are at 5 volts, but newer ones are at 3.3 uh, volts and even becoming lower. Um, so there are several situations, if, uh, several possible solutions um, to deal with these devices operating at different levels. Uh, one of them is to change a different part and to have a 5 volt tolerant device if you want to really work um, together on both. Uh, side, because if you put a five volt on a three point three volt device, and if that three point three volt device, the maximum voltage level is not as high as five, then you are damaging that device. Um, you know, if you happen to have a three point three volt device that can tolerate five volt, that does not mean that you can connect them directly, because the difference of these two. Um, Voltage supplies is, you know, uh, about two volts, and you will ha possibly have some noise margin, so there will be uh, mismatching logic levels. So by that we mean, for cases are you, you have a voltage level uh, which will be recognized as high for three point three volt devices, but at the same time it will be recognized as low for a five volt device. Uh, so that's where the mismatch uh, happens. So we'll use a solution called voltage level shifter, uh, which can support uh, bidirectional level shifting uh, without using a, a direction control signal. Uh, this is the uh, one example of using logic level shifters. Okay, so uh, coming to our an um, Arduino device. Uh, we're showing the Arduino uh, board here. Um, this is the Mega 2560. And we have um, right here, this is the SDA SCL. Uh, these two wires that you can connect to uh, to hook up a few I2C devices to the Arduino development board. 
And in our lab too, we will be using a uh, I2C device that is the MPU 6050 